Yes, we can, we can uh, run the video and welcome to those who, um, who watch on YouTube. For those of you who don't know, Crossover has a YouTube channel. And uh, all you have to do is type into YouTube Crossover Christian Church and usually the uh, sermon is up on a Tuesday, the latest to Wednesday. We get everything running. So last week I started um, a series called Positive Truths for Troubled Times. And <clears throat> last week we looked at rumors, rumors of wars and um, conspiracies. And, and the reality is that we are living in the end times. So what does that mean for us? You know, are we just supposed to hunker down and survive and, and wait until Jesus comes again? There's so much more, but we need to understand, first of all, what God, God's plan is. We need to understand, um, and today I'm going to be looking at what the spirit of our times is, because we're either going to be dictated to by the spirit of our times, and live under what we don't even realize we're living under or come into living in the fullness of the Spirit of Christ. So last week I touched on a scripture that really um, describes the spirit of our times. Paul writes, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then there's this line at the end, having a form of godliness but denying its power, which means to some great extent, this is a description of religious people people in the house of God rather than people out the house of God. People who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. So if we were able to kind of step outside the, the world and look into the culture of the world, this would be some of what we see all around the world. This is really a breaking out what the spirit of our times is all about. And it's not just in recent times. When you go and look through the book of Judges in the Old Testament, what you find is the statement that each man did what was right in his own eyes. And that is really the spirit of our times today. Each man does what is right in his own eyes. And you realize that people form belief systems, what they believe, uh, what they believe in, how they should live. So much of it is dictated by our culture. Look at the movies, look at the music that you listen to, the lyrics. There is so much that we just absorb without even realizing what we're absorbing. We also find good as well in the world. It's not all bad. Like, shh. There's also good. But we have to be able to discern the spirit of our times. Why? Because we're either going to live in the spirit of our times, or we're going to learn to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes you can wake up on a Monday morning and go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, and by lunchtime, you slap bang in the middle of this. You don't even need to get to work for that to happen. You just need to get out on the LIE or 25, and suddenly you find that person's not going to overtake you. We, um, we own a Prius, and this week the Prius just went over 100K on the clock. And there's, there's something about an, an energy efficient car that really gets to some people on the road. So uh, this, is, this has happened over and over again, guys, where um, I'm waiting at a red traffic light and a big truck pulls up next to me and there's just no way. So they're going to get a Prius, let a Prius pull off quicker than them. That's part of this 
spirit of our times. So what I want to encourage today, if you missed last week, please go and reference the message last week. What I want to encourage today is that we need to learn to build our world view, not around the circumstances in our lives, not around the, the, what we feel in the moment, or what culture is telling us. We need to learn to build our world view, what we believe, what we do, how we do it, around the Word of God. And um, I want to start today by reading from Ephesians, of, uh, Ephesians 1. Paul writes in verse 9 and 10, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, God, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are also on earth in him. And it goes on over these few verses, 9, 10 and 11, um, in fact, in the original language is one long sentence, 202 words, unbelievable. But when you start to unpack what Paul is telling the Ephesian church here, Paul is speaking about God's plan, God's plan for humanity. And God's plan for humanity is all about being in Him. So for us to really build a worldview, what you believe and why, which frames what you do and how you live. For us to do that, we've, we've really got to go back to the beginning. And the beginning for us is Genesis, uh, which in Hebrew is uh, Bereshit, which is the book of beginnings. And when you look at Genesis, it's actually an ancient poem. It's written in the, in the form of a narrative poem. And as you go and look at it, you get an understanding of God's seed plan from before we were ever created. But let's go back to Genesis 2, where God spoke. He said, let us make man in our image. So he made man and woman. And the Garden of Eden was this place of wonderful innocence. <laughs> God gave Adam and Eve one condition. You will not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat, freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will not eat, for in the day you eat you will surely die. Now we know the story that unfolded, right? Eve had a conversation with the serpent. The serpent pointed out the wonderful fruit on this particular tree. Eve succumbed and realized immediately that if, if Adam didn't eat of the fruit, she would be alienated and estranged on her own. So she persuaded Adam to come in and eat of the fruit. What happened was they did not physically die. And this is where you start to get some of the poem and the narrative, um, the descriptive language of ancient writing to give us an understanding of the seed plot God always had for us. What was lost was the loss of innocence. Innocence is the knowledge only of good. Innocence is freedom from guilt because of ignorance of evil. And you, you get this portrayal where God came every day to fellowship with Adam and Eve in the garden to, to talk about what they did that day. And God comes looking for Adam and Eve after they've eaten. And suddenly Adam and Eve know they're naked. So they hide in the garden because there's now an awareness and vulnerability and shame and guilt there's this complex mass of emotions, right? And when God calls Adam, Adam, where are you? And Adam comes out. Um, Adam actually says, we hate it because we were naked. And God says, who told you you were naked? Who told you? Immediately in that moment, 
there's a recognition, there's a naming of this loss of innocence. So it's important for us to, to understand that part of God's original plan for us was a place of innocence, an absence of evil. Whoops. The knowledge only of good. So ever since that first moment in the Garden of Eden and the loss of innocence, part of what humanity keeps striving for is finding meaning, uh, finding meaning of life, finding your place in the cosmos, finding where you fit and why you fit. And so much of life is just in this relentless pursuit, this seeking, this trying to fill the void that only one thing can fill, and his name is Jesus. Now something we come to here in the Garden of Eden is very important, not only to build your worldview. Uh, next week I'm going to be talking about the, the subject, if God is good, why does evil exist? If God is good, why do the innocent suffer? And, and one of the things we've got to understand is God gives us the gift of free will, starting right from the beginning of time. Adam and Eve were given a condition. This was for their own good. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God did not dispose of the tree. You hear what I'm saying? So God didn't take the tree out of the way so that there wouldn't be any problem. And, and I think parents really understand that. Parents want to. There's just this desire, this innate desire. Let's just take. If, if this is going to be a temptation to you, let's just take it out of the way. But God leaves the tree. And he says, don't touch it. And in that, there's an exercising of free will. So one aspect that we'll come back to next week, one aspect of um, if God is good, why is there evil? One aspect is our own free will. And we have to learn to exercise our free will in alignment with God's designs. And only as we do that, and you and I both know, free will sometimes stops immediately the fridge door opens. It's that easy, right? So, only as we learn to align ourselves with the, de with the desires of God, does that begin to shift. And when you look at billions and billions of people, all seeking to find their own purpose and build their own worldview, you realize how much the world needs God and how much we need to invest ourselves not only in, in living in ways that please God, but in reaching people with the love of God in order for the flow of humanity to change. But we'll get to, to more of that in a moment. So before I move on from this, I, I do want to say from the point where Adam and Eve were moved out of, the, they, they were exiled out of the Garden of Eden. Um, which is really that place of utopia, the place of perfection that everyone longs for. When you go and read through the rest of the book of Genesis, what you find is the unraveling or the, the exhibition of human nature without the full presence of God. And so what you find through Genesis is the first murders, adultery, depression, anxiety, suicide, and what you find as you look into how humanity takes care of itself is you start to see the consequences of the spirit of our times. And one of the reasons I'm wanting to push into this particular series um, is that we are surrounded by depression. We're surrounded by high levels of anxiety. There is an all-time high statistic of um, teenage suicides because of anxiety and depression. So you've got to realize that for us as believers, we, we've got to learn to discern, to live in discernment because we're living under a cloud. You know, the, the smart count in California gets posted um, daily wherever you drive in California. We live under a, a cloud of smog, 
and I'm talking spiritually. Now, if you travel quite a bit, you'll find that when you move from city to city, you'll actually be aware of diff a different spirit that you're coming to. There are times that there's real oppression or there's just a sense of lightness. It's part of what I'm talking about here. So Genesis is the book of beginnings where we begin to realize that there was a dislocation of God's original plan of perfect fellowship. But God's plan was always about perfect fellowship. And we'll unpack that a little bit in a few minutes. What I want to look at is some of the personal belief systems that uh, we, we find in the times in which we live. The first is fatalism, the belief that all events are predetermined and therefore inevitable. And you see that in songs like, what will be, will be. You know, it's out of my hands. And, and there's a distancing, there's a detachment from any personal involvement or accountability. You are not the main, you are not the player in your own life. There's the belief system of nihilism, the rejection of all religious and moral principles, often in the belief that life is meaningless. And I was reading a quote about this um, by, by, uh, by someone in literature, I forget his name, who, who spoke about all of humanity being just like insects. Really, if you, if you picture a dog or a cat with fleas or ticks, um, what, what nihilism is, is, you know, your life is as good as that insect. Once you've picked off the animal, there you go. Life is over. Very bleak place. What we do find in, um, as you go through these belief systems, that there's often a merging of belief systems. You don't even realize that you've bought into some of this. And my life doesn't matter. That I don't determine anything. Determinism, the belief that all events, including human action, are ultimately determined by causes external to the world. And part of what uh, people, uh, scientific determinism, the extreme of it is, is your actions are not a product of your choices. Your actions are a product of your gene pool. So this means that um, you, you, you're clear of personal responsibility. It, it also means that nothing you do actually really counts because you're simply the product of your gene pool. I got a call from my father who has had a, um, a tremendous healing from pancreatic cancer. And he had gone to a geneticist to have the profile of his particular cancer, um, you know, spelled out. So I got this call to say, I need to um, go and see a geneticist because of a certain blood type. If this is in my blood, then I'm, I'm kind of highlighted for the following kinds of cancer. And I want to look at the phone and say, are you kidding me? This may be uh, showing up in the gene pool, but you know the first part of the call should be, let's pray because God has already healed me and we can, we can take this to the next generation. Well, that's where I am. <laughs> Not everything is scientifically determined. Relativism, the belief that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context. This is exactly where most of us are most of the time. If it's good for you, it's good for you. If it's good for me, it's good for me. So there's this sense of living, you know, in complete acceptance and tolerating everything. It's almost as if we don't know how to live with our own convictions without judging others about their convictions. It's, it's a case of, if God has called me to certain things, I can live with complete conviction about that, with no apology. But my convictions don't need to be your convictions. That takes me out of relativism. Living in relativism is where 
there's just an open playing field, which is where we are today in every respect. And underlying every belief system out there today, I believe, is skepticism, the belief that true knowledge or knowledge in a particular area is uncertain. God is unknowable and the existence of God is unprovable. Because we live in such a material, digitized, concrete kind of world, uh, God has almost been put in parentheses. And so underlying everything is this attitude, well, prove it, prove it, prove it. And this skepticism only starts getting nudged and pushed often when people are in personal crisis. The other underlying belief system that I believe is really prevalent in our times is hedonism. The belief that pleasure or happiness is the soul or chief good in life. And when you tie hedonism in with relativism, you realize it's all just about having a good time because one day you're going to die. And that's it. Over and out. And I don't know how many good times you can have before it gets old. How many times you can go to a club, how many times you can get a high, how many times you can get smashed before it's no longer a good time. I do know that that is not where I want to live. Because there's so much more available, so much more that God has in store for us. Question to ask is, are we falling under the influence? And I mean, are we falling under the influence of the spirit of our times? When you go back to 2 Timothy 3, we live in perilous times where people are lovers of self, haters, rash, conceited, unforgiving, slanderous. Are we living under the influence of the times of skepticism, of relativism, of hedonism? The challenge is there for us, learning where we need to learn to find God's plan and live in the fullness of that on a day by day, moment by moment, moment notice. Um, Romans 12 verse 2 is really a, a, a key verse for us. Do not be conformed to this world in the original. It says do not be conformed to the patterns of this world to the belief systems of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can discern what is good, perfect, and acceptable to God. And it's really three um, degrees, if you like, the good, the perfect, the acceptable will of God. <clears throat> this verse also tells us you and your own understanding. Your understanding is limited. I respect you guys, I love you, but it's limited. My understanding, our understanding is limited. Our wisdom is li limited. This side of the reservoir of God, transformation is only going to happen in the hands of God. Transformation is only going to happen. The renewing of your mind as you start to frame your worldview by, by God's purpose and by God's word. Can I get an amen? Amen. We shape our belief system around what God reveals to us in His Word and then what we know about the nature of God. And to come back to Ephesians, Ephesians 1, that 202 word um, presentation Paul gives, is that God has a plan. God has always had a plan. The fall that happened in the Garden of Eden, God knew. And God's intent has always been the same. So there are three truths that I want to, positive truths that I want to bring out from this teaching in Ephesians. But I want to frame it this way. We need to learn to live in the shadow of God's influence as opposed to the shadow of the spirit of our times. And this is a verse that I'd love to have you take into the week. It's about living in the shadow of the Most High. He who dwells in the shelter of the, of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom is my strength. 
Because of the nature of human nature, we wonder, we get distracted. We get willful, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, and we, we, we kind of do our own thing, and we've got to return to living in the shadow of his influence. And that's something, it's an easy, it's a visual image reminder for us. Come back into his shadow. Come back into his shadow. So three truths. The first is that God has a plan. God has a plan. Ephesians 1 verse 9. He has made known to us the mystery of his will. From the beginning of time, God's plan has been one of lavish grace. And it's tied up in this fellowship with God. It's an amazing, incredible thing that we are, all God wants, He longs for fellowship with us. He was, uh, his plan was put together before, all, before creation. And yes, part of the plan. And this is often mentioned when, when there's teaching on end times. That the Lord will come again when all people have heard the gospel. It's boiled down much more than this. It's boiled down because there are evangelism plans all over the world. So that the, the good news would get out so Jesus can come back. Yes, the reality of God's plan is that God wants to be in relationship with every human being. That is God's plan. Which is incredible, it's remarkable. So, it's an incredible thing that His grace is waiting for every person ever to live in time on the face of the earth. He desires all people to be saved so that His abundant grace can come home in every heart. This is not about an evangelism strategy. It's about relationship. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's a complete different weight of gravity in this. It's, we, can, we can have plans, but we've got to, our perspective has to change, is what I'm saying, in, in that God is relationship based. God is relation. And what he's looking for is relationship. The second truth is that everything in history flows into his plan. His plan. The good, the bad, the ugly. God's middle name, you know what his middle name is? His middle name is Redeemer, which means to buy back. God sent his son to redeem humanity, right? But right through scripture, right through time, you see the work of God, the activity of God is to redeem, to buy back. So even with Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden, one of the things um, that was spoken is by, by the sweat of your brow, you will, you, you will till the ground. And, and really, part of that was redemptive because it gave Adam and Eve purpose outside of the Garden of, of Eden, if that makes any sense. If you think of the story of Joseph, who was um, sold into slavery, and his life went through cycles of tremendous suffering, of um, spiraling down and then uh, making some progress and spiraling down. And through it all, tremendous trial and affliction, personally on a man. But through it all, God, all the time at work, to buy back so that his purpose in Joseph's life could be redeemed. Which you find at the end of the book of Genesis, you find Joseph saying, when he's restored with his brothers who had sold him into slavery, what you intended for my harm, God has turned to my good. And that is the picture of God's redemption for every person on the face of the earth. And this is why God is God. Because quite honestly, there's some people you don't want to see that kind of redemption for, right? Oh, you guys are quiet. <laughs> for any of you who have read the Harry Potter series, uh, in, in Harry Potter, there's, um, there's the, the legend of the, this, the household slave 
the elf who had to serve the same family from generation to generation and it was just perpetual bondage for the household elf. And, and one such elf by the name of Dobby, the only way the servitude could be redeemed was if the owner gave a piece of clothing to the elf. At that point, the elf was relief, re released from servitude. And so Dobby's master gave him a sock and Dobby, Dobby became a, a, a free elf. But he didn't know what to do with his freedom. And I think there's so much truth for us in that. That God has given us so much, but we don't know what to do with it. Everything in history flows into his plan. We have an inheritance in him. We are predestined. We have a purpose in him. And I know this, there's a lot of deep theological truth. But if you can tap into the fact that God has a purpose for you, that God has a purpose for us in our times. I, I said last week, the fact is that God, for such a time as this, we have been born. God has given us the marvelous responsibility, opportunity, privilege of living in these times so that we can live fully in His hands and be part of His plan. Even in the worst of times, God is working to redeem, to buy humanity back from slavery. Every single one of us, a little Dobby. <laughs> Truth number three is that Jesus is the point of the plan. Jesus has always been the point of the plan. In the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both of which are in heaven and on earth, in him. How many of you would love a perfect, wonderful relationship with a perfect, wonderful soulmate? How many of you would love a best, best friend who actually gets you before you open your mouth even? We all, that's part of the longing of humanity, is to have that phenomenal level of connection that phenomenal level of intimacy. We are wired like that because Jesus is meant to be that. Now we're wired for human intimacy, but it's an echo of what this, this plan is, and that is to be in Him. To have such a union that I don't know where He ends and I begin. And you, 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 when you begin to read the writings of the mystics, you find this, that there's just a, a flow, a seamless flow of relationship, of communication, of communication that goes beyond words. And again, because we live in such a tangible, concrete world, it's hard for us even to begin to grasp that God wants, that God longs, that God desires for that level of intimacy, communication, of fellowship. So, guys, this is the thing. Our world system, our belief system, our world view, is not based on philosophy. It's not based on doctrine. It's based on the person of Jesus Christ. And when you can begin to really live in that, your life is going to absolutely blow up with vitality. Because what happens is, your life is no longer determined by how you feel on a Sunday morning or a Monday morning. Your life is not determined by your circumstances. Your life is determined by this reality. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. So I might be having a bad day, but guess what? Jesus is in me. And the day is about to turn around, right? Amen. Amen. Sin. Whoops. All right, 
that's just flipping over. Sin is anything that fractures our relationship with God. So what you look at again, just this wonderful image in the Garden of Eden. One condition, Adam and Eve don't eat of that tree. One condition, just one thing in all of life that you don't do. Just one thing. And of course, it's just that one thing that you want to go and do, right? And what that does is it dislocates, it puts out of joint relationship with God. So God is always at work reaching out for us by His Spirit. But from our side, we have to be able to shape our human behavior, to identify, discern who and what we are, so that we can begin to submit to who and what He is. So, how do we live under the, under the influence of the shadow of the Almighty? And um, it's, it's something I want to just go through very quickly, um, is four R's, living in the Spirit of Christ, under the influence of the Spirit of Christ, and um, beyond the spirit of our times. The first is to return to innocence, the innocence of the Garden of Eden. Um, innocence being the knowledge of good. There, there are a couple of wonderful scriptures in the New Testament. To the pure, all things are pure. Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true and lovely and, and honorable, whatever is of good report, think on these things. It's part of why I frame this series, Positive Truths for Troubled Times, is that we've got to come to a place where we see not only ourselves, but we see our world as God sees, broken and waiting for relationship with God. So that we move and live not from a place of skepticism, but a place of trust in God. It's, a comp it's, it's, it's turning life upside down. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's that great little anecdote of an older brother going to a, ba a baby sibling in, in the crib and saying, tell me, what's it like? I'm beginning to forget what it's like. And it's, it's, it's just a wonderful portrayal of the innocence of, of little ones coming from heaven having a full knowledge of, of the innocence of goodness in God. So we need to be able to return to innocence, which is not stupidity, it's not naivety, but it's learning to see as God sees. And it starts with getting right with God. One of our spiritual practices is confession. And, and really, confession needs to happen on a daily basis. You know, at the end of every day, take a moment to examine yourself and to say, Father, forgive me. I lost it yeah. I thought about that. I did X, Y, and Z. You keep a short account of the junk going on in your life, and it begins to filter out and cleanse out. Confession leads to repentance where you begin to turn around and turn away from uh, that which is contrary to the knowledge of God. I came across a wonderful um, little acronym, PUSH, pray until something happens. Get right with God. Pray until something happens. PUSH, get right with God. The second R is to restore the right influences in your life. Restore the right influences in your life. Now, some of the consequences of the spirit of our times is this um, um, immense amount of anxiety, of depression, and I would say another uh, real consequence is rage, anger. So you, you, you just have this sense of animosity just bubbling over, um, which is why we have road age and crazy stuff that happens out there. Black Friday is a great opportunity for people's rage to come into full focus in that one perfect sale item. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so every week in our bulletin, we have a memory verse of the week, and I put in a spiritual practice. 
And the idea is really to be able to take that verse and apply it in my life every single day for seven days. Actually, if you do it for 10 days, it begins to be a habit. Of course, breaking a habit takes much longer. We know that. Your first initial break point is a minimum of three weeks. So if you start to develop good habits, they're going to last longer than you even know to put them into practice. So choose the peace of God in the midst of turmoil and trouble. Choose the peace of God in the midst of animosity and strife in your own life and hostility. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Another verse says, you have not because you ask not. So if you're asking for peace, make that request known to God. And here's your spiritual practice. Each time you become troubled by something, stop and ask God for help. How often? Every time. Every time. Stop and ask God for help. Breathe out your troubles and breathe in God's peace. You just think about that and something starts to change in you, doesn't it? Breathe out your troubles and breathe in God's peace. So restore the right influences in your life by choosing the peace of God. And that means you're setting your intent. I'm going to be dominated by the peace of God, not by the troubles of this situation. The second in restoring the right influences is to choose the joy of the Lord. Psalm 16 speaks about the paths of, um, the paths of life in the presence of God. And that verse is again repeated in Acts, 20, um, Acts 2, 26 to 28. You have made known to me the paths of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Joy is something far more than happiness. Happiness is determined by the circumstances of my life. Happiness is determined by the moment and the mood, right? And moods change frequently. For some, not so often. And that's probably a blessing. Joy can be a constant flow in our lives. And when we begin to live in that reservoir of joy, everything above that changes. And I really encourage you to start to pursue the joy of God. Because the joy of God will undergo you in the toughest of times. There's that statement from Scripture, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when you can choose joy, you are less dominated by circumstances. When you can choose joy, the joy of the Lord, and this is not about false, fake religiosity. This, this is about knowing, because I'm alive and I'm in relationship with God, there's a flow here that is amazing. I'm living in a living fountain of joy that comes from Him. Not for me. And I venture to say the joy of the Lord in you is one of the greatest, most powerful witnesses to Jesus Christ that anyone will see. The spiritual practice, each time you become aware of a loss of joy, ask Him to show you the path of life that leads to joy. And a wonderful way to choose joy is to choose to bless someone in your life. And that can be a random stranger. That can be the guy at the traffic light who's uh, trying to cut you off. You bless them. You bless them with your words. You bless them by, um, by, by random acts of kindness, by acts of love. And you start to open yourself up to this cycle of abundance as you sow your reap, as you sow your reap. And you start to find that God opens up in you an enlarged heart for the fullness of the things of God. Return to innocence. Restore the right influences in your life. And then reach out to others. Is the third, uh, the third R. Reach out to others. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this, my friends, is part of God's plan is not for us to be dominated by the troubled times. 
But for us to reach out to others with the love of God, to reach out with others, to encourage them to get into relationship with God. The gospel, like I said, is not an idea or a philosophy. It's about the person of Jesus. And I said this last week, the best way that you can share about Jesus is share about the troubles that you've been in.